Thank you. Dr. Lawton told me that I'd be talking to a mess of seniors who are transitioning into retirement and such, and he was describing me. So <laughs> it's a welcome aboard. I, I've been going to the uh, Sizzler sal Senior Salad Bar every Wednesday for the past few weeks, and they let me through. So I, I guess I made that, uh, that, that new level of uh, life. Uh, but for some reason, I'm still working. I don't know what the heck is happening. But uh, in any case, thanks for having me here. Uh, we're going to be talking about sleep, and that's me up there. And uh, as Dr. Lawton said, I'm kind of a homegrown guy. Uh, I didn't travel too much in my career. I, I did my um, undergraduate work over here at Chapman when it was still a college and it was still affordable. And uh, then... Um, uh, I practiced, uh, we went to medical school at UC Irvine, and then I came over here to UC Irvine Medical Center and did my internship, my residency, my fellowship. Then I went into private practice for about 10 years in Long Beach, uh, practicing neurology and some sleep medicine. And then after that, I returned to UCI and took over the sleep disorder center over there. Uh, UCI is actually, it had the, uh, first or second sleep disorder center on the west coast and it um, it was like the fifth accredited sleep disorder center in the entire nation so it was a real front runner in terms of sleep medicine it was established by dr sasson my uh, mentor and he's the one who kind of sucked me into this uh, later on uh, as i went along in my career and he's uh, long retired in the uh, wine company a country growing wine and making wine and stuff and so he's having fun now I hope but um, you know we were one of the front runners here and uh, eventually I kind of evolved out of the university system too many politics and bureaucracy and stuff and I, I kind of drifted over to St. Joe's where I've been now for probably uh, almost 20 years guy I am old <laughs> so in any case so I've uh, been a local boy here but uh, uh, sleep uh, has really grown uh, over the years and it's been a real common thing. People like to talk about it on the news and stuff and the more uh, they look into it, uh, the m more problems they find. Just a little bit of a coronavirus update. I got an email from the medical officer at St. Joe's uh, giving us the score here. In the past uh, six weeks, uh, the emergency room at St. Joe's uh, has seen 8,000 patients uh, in general, not all coronavirus patients. But out of those, only eight uh, were tested or needed to be tested for uh, coronavirus. Four were deemed inappropriate. I don't know what that means. Three were negative and there's only one pending and they're gonna see what that one shows. So what they were trying to emphasize is that there isn't a whole lot of this thing going around yet, and uh, hopefully we're going to be able to duck it as uh, we get into the warmer months and such. So thanks for coming out and seeing me and not being afraid of coronavirus. Uh, okay. Um, so, as I was saying, sleep medicine, uh, in, before the 1950s, uh, the way that medicine uh, viewed sleep was kind of a passive period of time when... Uh, nothing really happened uh, to health or to the human body because the person was just lying there asleep. Nothing was going on. And then some researchers started looking at EEGs, uh, brain waves, uh, when people were asleep and they discovered that there was this REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, that is associated with dreaming. And from there, the research blossomed. And as time went on, uh, as we developed uh, sleep medicine as its own medical specialty in the late 70s. And uh, again, the more you look, the more you find that people uh, have uh, you know, some type of sleep disorder, insomnia and sleep apnea and whatnot. So a lot of things have been happening with sleep medicine over the years. Um, the Sleep Disorder Center, uh, it was one of the first kind of center concepts. You, you hear a lot of centers nowadays, you know, cancer centers and whatnot and stuff. But sleep was actually one of the first uh, entities that put together a center concept where people could go in, in, to a single place and uh, you know, get their uh, sleep needs taken care of. And uh, there's a lot of sleep centers out there. We were just discussing that uh, a minute ago where um, many of them are not accredited 
and there's only a few accredited centers in Orange County. Um, there's SoCal, which is in Anaheim, and uh, St. Joseph, and Hogue, and Mission, and there's uh, some, there's one in Orange County uh, down in Irvine, uh, and, and most of the other ones are not accredited, which doesn't mean that they're not any good, but they haven't adhered to the standards of which, uh, you know, you can be assured that they're doing everything correctly. Um, for instance, I was complaining about, uh, uh, we're over here spending all this time and effort and stuff so that we can maintain our accreditation and do everything up to standards, and then I'm competing with some facility down the road called Sleep Apnea Girl, and they have no accreditation at all, and no, most of them not even have any experience in sleep. They're just doing testing and stuff. So you have to be careful about where you go uh, to make sure that you're getting everything done correctly. So the, there is an accreditation process and there's also a board certification process for the physicians and also the technical specialists, uh, the re, uh, their sleep techs that do all the testing and stuff and they also have an accreditation process too. Uh, St. Joseph is, as I said, one of the accredited ones and uh, you know, they're staffed by certified professional that me, and uh, there's another doctor there and um, you know, all, the, all the techs are also uh, certified uh, sleep tech, so we try to do that. Now, when in the in in uh, in a sleep center, you try to make the sleep room look like a regular bedroom. So they're more like hotel rooms than they are, uh, you know, hospital rooms. Because everybody's always afraid if I come and I stay overnight, you know, is it going to be like in a hospital? But no, this is a bit of an exaggeration. Okay, <laughs> I I googled honeymoon suites and this came up, so I so I put that in there, but. Um, but again, you know, it's more like a hotel room uh, with a camera and maybe some wire connections and stuff in it. But the rest of it, we try to make it as comfortable as possible for people. Okay, so what's normal sleep? Um, the average person or average adult sleeps about seven and a half hours. Uh, we also have kind of a second period, those naps that they were just talking about. In the mid-afternoon, it's actually normal for us to kind of hit a dip where we become physically sleepy and we should be napping. And in our society, we kind of push ourselves through it and keep going. But in other societies, uh, you know, the so-called siesta time and stuff is adhered to uh, throughout, throughout the world. And it seems like the closer you get to the equator where it gets hot in the afternoon, the more often people will take that time off and sleep. But it is a natural time to sleep. And uh, if you can take advantage of it, uh, it's not a bad thing to do. Um, an average adult will experience five or more awakenings each night, and most of the time they successfully fall back asleep, and they don't even recall what's happening. Usually those are just body position changes. When we're uncomfortable, we move to a new position. And everybody has a bad night's sleep occasionally, and uh, you know this is where you might awaken early and you can't get back to sleep, or you can't get to sleep in the first place and stuff, and that's part of normal sleep too. M many times people, uh, when they start having problems with sleep, they, um, they forget what normal sleep is all about. So sleep and aging, what kind of things happen to us as we grow older? Uh, so uh, th this is Rembrandt, uh, it's called the sleeping old man or something like that, or old man sleeping. But um, as we grow older, the time we sleep at night decreases, our sleep becomes much more fragmented, and usually the fragmentation comes from some of the sleep disorders that we uh, acquire as we grow old, you know, things like sleep apnea and periodic limb movements, um, but also there's a lot of aches and pains and, uh, you know, going to the bathroom and stuff like that, that awaken us and then we go back to sleep. Um, napping increases because uh, you know, our sleep at night is disturbed, and so we might have a greater tendency to take that nap time in the afternoon. Uh, and then I put two conf conflicting things, you know, insomnia increases and hypersomnia increases. And it kind of depends on the person, because there are conditions as we grow older that we develop that can make us excessively sleepy in the daytime. And there's also conditions that we develop uh, as we grow older that interrupt our sleep at night. So it can go both ways. And this is kind of a representation of, you know, normal and average. And so let's say everybody underneath that curve is in the normal range, but the average people are up there on, right in the center 
you know, they're, they're the ones, they're most of the people. But that doesn't mean the guy out here on either side, uh, you know, the guys out there in the end of the curve are not in a normal range. And it's important, again, to kind of think about that, what normal and average is. While most people fall into the average range, some people are a little bit above or below that uh, median part. And so, again, uh, there are people who worry, you know, I'm not sleeping enough, uh, you know, something must be wrong. And uh, you hear all this stuff on the radio and TV, you got to sleep at least eight hours a night or you're not going to live long enough and such like that. Uh, TV and radio or whatnot, they like to sensationalize things and so they say stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> but it's, uh, for sleep, Normal is not is what average is, you know, it's not eight hours a night, it's what's best for the individual. So it, it's an individual thing. So the normal amount of sleep for an individual is the amount necessary to promote uh, wakeness during the daytime. Uh, so that's the main reason for sleep, is to keep us awake in the daytime. And sometimes put, people put a lot of a more emphasis on it, you know, they, it's going to make me young again, handsome, and you know, make me feel good all over and such. And uh, they put so much uh, emphasis on it, uh, they develop performance anxieties associated with going to sleep. So they get, become anxious. Am I going to get enough sleep? And the anxiety is stimulating, and that keeps them awake. So it actually does the opposite thing. So don't chase after what you think is normal. About, uh, oof, it's probably about four years ago, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine put together a special task force to see, um, to determine what is the, the normal amount of sleep or how much sleep should we be getting every day. And they, I think they spent like six months or a year trying to figure it out. And then at the end, they came out with this declaration. Uh, normal amounts is about seven hours. But there are people who are less than seven hours and people who are more than seven hours. So it's just getting back to what I said in the first place, is that, yeah, there's an average, but there are people on either side of the average. So when it comes to how much sleep does an individual need, it's the amount that keeps them awake in the daytime. So uh, when you talk about abnormal sleep, uh, these are the things that go wrong. So insomnia, where you have difficulty falling or remaining asleep. Hypersomnia, when you're sleepy at abnormal times of the day. Uh, movement disorders, uh, things uh, concerning legs and other things and, uh, that happen during sleep. Uh, sleep cycle disturbances, those are the circadian rhythm disturbances where we have a 24-hour cycle we're supposed to be following, but uh, for some reason our cycle is off somehow. And parasomnias are uh, kind of a catch uh, category of a lot of other stuff that can happen during, uh, you know, sleep. And it stems from things like sleepwalking and REM behavior disorder, but also extends to things like uh, acid regurgitation and that sort of stuff too. Medical problems that interfere with sleep. So if we start with insomnia, um, so sleep is kind of, a, the ability to fall asleep is actually a balance between whatever is stimulating you and keeping you awake and how sleepy you become. And the, the drive to sleep is uh, similar to the drive to breathe. You know, you, uh, you can voluntarily overcome your breathing and hold your breath, uh, and you can do that for so long, but pretty soon the internal drive takes over and it forces you to breathe, and you actually breathe harder and deeper to make up for what you weren't doing. So sleep is very much like that. Uh, you know, so if we're uh, doing something to ourselves to keep us awake at night, eventually it starts coming out and it overcomes us. So the most common causes of uh, insomnia are poor sleep habits and psychological stimulation. What that just means is very often people will have some difficulties with their sleep, and it throws them off, and then um, they try to correct it, and they fixate on it, and the more they try to control it, the more out of control it gets. So they develop bad habits with sleep. Medical ca uh, causes include menopause, substance abuse is, you know, any type of uh, drug or alcohol or whatnot, 
And medical problems, you know, there are some medical problems that might interrupt our sleep, hyperthyroidism, again, pain and whatnot. Um, physical causes include hum hunger, temperature, sound, light. In other words, there's physical things in the bedroom that will wake you up and counteract that drive to sleep. So what, what can you do about it? Improve the bedroom environment. So you, you, you do the things that you can control in the bedroom, you know, not too hot uh, and not too cold. I think this is that ice hotel in Norway or someplace. And then, you know, you, you, you keep it dark and, uh, you know, you try to keep it quiet. So you're decreasing the... Uh, you're decreasing all the stimulus that might be there to counteract your sleepiness and keep you from sleeping. Uh, I put that in there um, because somebody actually did a paper where they found that you know people who sleep with their pets have a lot of sleep disturbance because the pets are not on a 24-hour sleep cycle as humans are, and so they'll be wanting to get up in the middle of the night and do things and stuff and wake you up and, and such. And so they do uh, cause problems. So psychophysiological insomnias. It's just a fancy way of saying uh, psycho is mental, uh, physiological stimulation, uh, the, the mental stimulation that causes insomnia. So it's probably the most common insomnia. And this one, everybody has had it at some time in their life and usually multiple times. And basically what it is, is there's some stimulation in your life that you get that uh, will cause you to think about it. So, you know, you uh, lose a loved one, you, you have a test the next day that you have to take if you're a student or something, you get in an argument with some, you know, family member or something and you're upset about it. So you take this stuff to bed with you and you think about it and the mental stimulation keeps you from falling asleep. Now, usually this is transient, so it lasts a short period of time and there's also a chronic version. But the transient one, um, there's a distinct precipitating event. In other words, something in your life happened that you know, produces good or bad mental stimulation. Good mental stimulation is you won the lottery, you're so excited, you're gonna spend all this money, it keeps you awake at night. So it can go either way, but most of the time it's some stressful thing that happens to us. And then the uh, mental stimulation inhibits our ability to fall asleep or stay asleep. And as we get away from that event that occurred, it becomes less important in our life, so it produces less mental stimulation. In other words, we don't think about it as much, and the whole thing kind of fades away and you go back into your natural pattern. The chronic, uh, oh, the treatment of uh, transient is, you know, identifying what the problem is. In other words, if you have an event in your life, uh, can you do something about it and then lessen the stress associated with it? And then if people end up coming to the doctor about this, most people, they'll just kind of write it out and it goes away. But, um, you know, if they do come in, reassurance that uh, it, it's nothing to be worried about and don't think about it so much and keep your confidence up and you, it'll go away. Uh, maintain good sleep hygiene. It was just a fancy way of saying, you know, uh, keep a regular bed schedule. Don't stay in bed too long awake and don't get too frustrated. This might be the one uh, reason for using a prescription sleeping pill. They're effective, and if you just use them temporarily, they're okay, but they do alter sleep, and you can't keep using them forever because then you get hooked on them. Um, and uh, try to adjust the underlying stimulus. That's just a way of you know, seeing and if you cannot think about whatever it is that's bugging you so much. With the chronic version, There's, um, usually this evolves from the transient one. So you have something happen in your life and you develop difficulty with sleeping. And then instead of it kind of fading away as uh, the thing that caused it in the first place fades away, uh, a person will start to fixate on their sleep. So they've been having trouble sleeping. They start saying to themselves, I'm gonna make myself go to sleep, or they start saying, you know, there must be something really wrong with me because I can't sleep at night. And the more you think about it, the more mentally stimulating it is, and the less likely it is that you're gonna sleep, so because that interferes with your sleep. And you also develop this performance anxiety I was talking about, where you're thinking about it too much, and by the time you get yourself into bed, 
you're worried about whether you're going to sleep or not, you don't sleep because it's stimulating. Uh, the reversal of sleep cues is just that um, we go through little rituals before we go to bed at night. You know, you, you start to feel sleepy as you enter your sleep cycle, and then you say, okay, I'm going to go to bed, and then the rituals start. I go up to the bedroom, I change into my pajamas, I brush my teeth, I turn down the bed, I hop in the bed, I turn out the lights, and uh, all of these things, if nothing is going wrong with your sleep, they subconsciously and psychologically relax you because you're getting more and more prepared to go to sleep. And once you get into bed and you fall asleep, you're rewarded. Now, if you've been having trouble with insomnia, and every time you get into bed after all your rituals, you lay in there and you're awake and you're suffering and stuff, mentally you start associating the bed with being a bad place. So as you make your decision to go to bed at night and you get closer and closer and closer to your bed, uh, you get more and more anxious about whether you're going to sleep and that anxiety keeps you awake. And the, actually this is a very common cause of um, uh, sleep onset insomnia. So the all these sleep cues that normally relax us actually do the opposite in this situation. So it's just a bad habit, but it's a habit that we do every single night and it becomes reinforced and very strong because we do it so much. And so sometimes it's very difficult for people to uh, believe that this is all it is, is a bad habit. And then I, uh, sometimes I have to convince people, they go, are you sure there's not something worse wrong with me? No, there isn't. <laughs> we have to work on th these uh, basic things to get you sleeping again. So under, uh, uh, identifying the problem, what the problem is, and understanding it is the first step in treating this kind of insomnia. And then reducing sleep pressure. In other words, this is what I was talking about before, is that people put so much pressure on themselves to get to sleep that it keeps them awake. So you have to decrease um, your feelings about sleep. Like uh, <clears throat> you shouldn't care whether or not you fall asleep in 15 minutes or you sleep four hours as opposed to eight hours, uh, that sort of thing. So you lower your sleep goals so that you sleep enough so that you can function in the daytime. Stimulus control is what we're talking about with uh, you know, the stimulus in the bedroom and uh, also associating the bedroom with a good place to be uh, to sleep. Behavior modifications are little games that we teach people to control the excess thinking that happens to them when they're in bed and trying to go to sleep. And uh, sometimes uh, you have to treat the under psychologi underlying psychological problems. Uh, sometimes if somebody is an anxious person to begin with, <clears throat> or obsessing about things in general, if they apply that to trying to sleep, it just amplifies things and it makes it easier for them to do all these bad things. Okay, what else affects our sleep? See, now I'm in a crowd who remembers who the Rolling Stones are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know, it, uh, it wears you out after a while, and so, um, but it also affects sleep, uh, you know, the, the, the drugs parts. And what drugs are we exposed to in our daily lives? And sometimes we don't think of them as drugs, but, you know, caffeine is a stimulant, alcohol is a sedative, but it also has a rebound, and nic nicotine is a stimulant. Now, a lot of times people think it's actually the opposite, that it sedates you or calms you because of, of the habit they have with the cigarette but it's act, nicotine itself is actually a stimulant. And there's also withdrawal or rebound with that too. And then recreational drugs, you know, they do whatever they do. There's stimulants like amphetamines or cocaine and stuff that wake you up. And then there's narcotics and stuff that make you sleepy. So, uh, and, and I, I don't know, how many people are into recreational drugs here? <laughs> Nobody raised their hand. <laughs> no, but <laughs> I, I have people coming in that are RH. See, I include myself in that. That they they come in, they go. You know, I have those. Uh, I get those little THC uh, uh, gummy bears now, and I've been taking those, and those work pretty good. What do you think about those, doctor, and stuff? So, so those are the ones, the marijuana, uh, you know, gummy bears and stuff. So uh, they're, they're actually kind of ashamed that after all these years of not using marijuana and pot and stuff, that they're now using. But in any case, everything in moderation. 
Uh, and then there's also medicinal preparations. You know, there's over-the-counter stuff that sometimes contains substances that might awaken you and interfere with your sleep or the opposite. Uh, restless leg syndrome is a pretty common thing and it gets more common as we get older. Um, <clears throat> and there's two parts of restless legs. The actual restless leg syndrome is an ill-defined, unpleasant leg sensation. Uh, people will say, you know, it feels like tingling, it feels like aching, it feels like I need to stretch my muscles in my legs, um, but not exactly that. So they never pin it down exactly on how it feels. And the thing is, is that when the person gets this sensation, <clears throat> It compels them to move their legs, so they have to move their legs, and when they move their legs, it lessens the sensation, so they can relax and try to go to sleep, and as soon as they do, it happens again. So um, it follows a circadian rhythm. So again, the circadian rhythm is a 24-hour rhythm, and uh, even if a person might have it sometimes in the daytime, it usually is at its most intense right before bedtime, and that way it interferes with their ability to sleep. So restless leg syndrome actually causes in, uh, sleep onset insomnia, but you know about it because your legs are bugging you. Some people have it so bad that they get into bed and it gets so intense they have to get out of bed and walk around. They take showers and run water up and down their legs and stuff, and it's very uncomfortable. <clears throat> And then as the night goes on, it starts to diminish, and usually uh, from a combination of the, the sensation becoming less intense and them becoming exhausted, they pass out sometime in the early morning hours. It can be treated, luckily. A dopamine agonists are a certain type of medications that were originally used for Parkinson's disease, but they have an effect on this. And then <clears throat> sometimes it's associated with iron deficiency. So uh, checking the iron levels out and then uh, replacing iron will help it. There's a lot of other uh, over-the-counter type things that are uh, you know, often sold to treat this that have magnesium and calcium and other things in it. Those are usually not really effective. Periodic limb movements are often mistaken for restless legs. Uh, it's one of these uh, weird uh, exercises in logic where uh, every, almost everybody who has restless legs will have periodic limb movements when they fall asleep, but most people with periodic limb movements don't have uh, restless leg syndrome. And I know that sounds weird, but um, <clears throat> periodic limb movements are these leg jerks that occur after we fall asleep, and they're repetitive, and they happen maybe one to four times a minute. So they don't happen with a great frequency. You know, it's not like boom, 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 boom. It's more like boom and wait a minute, and boom and wait a minute. But they cause their problems that if that boom, the movement is strong enough, it can awaken you. It's kind of like somebody, you know, jiggling you a little bit, and you wake up and you fall back asleep. So the person who suffers periodic limb movements usually doesn't even know that they're doing it because they're sleeping through it. <clears throat> usually it's the, um, the bed partner will say, you know, they're, they're jerking the bed, over and over, or they're kicking me every so often. And so uh, that may be how it's diagnosed. And it has the same treatment as restless legs. So um, circadian rhythm disorders are again our sleep-wake cycle over a 24-hour period. So <clears throat> they can go wrong uh, with being delayed or advanced. So, Delayed sleep uh, phase syndrome, a person will not enter their sleep uh, cycle until, uh, you know, three, four, five hours later than normal. Again, normal is just the average. So, you know, they may not start to get sleepy until two or three o'clock in the morning. And then if you leave them alone, they want to sleep in until 10. So if, if they can follow that cycle, they're happy. They, um, <clears throat> you know, they, they sleep regular and they get enough sleep and the sleep is normal. Uh, the only problem is it's at an abnormal time. So these guys make great bartenders and <laughs> things like that. Yeah, <clears throat> but uh, it's, it's not an uncommon problem. And usually the problem arises when people try to fit this into a normal schedule. And so they're saying, oh geez, you know, I have to get up at six o'clock in the morning to, to go to work or do something. 
and so I better go to bed at 10 o'clock so I get enough sleep to get up at 6 o'clock and they're not ready because they haven't entered their sleep cycle so they're not sleepy so they don't uh, they have problems falling asleep until they get to 2 o'clock in the morning uh, when they enter their sleep cycle and then they can drop off and then you try to get them up at six and it's like pulling teeth You know you, some of them have several alarms and stuff that they have to do to get up and uh, So they feel really out of it and groggy until 10 o'clock comes along and they get out of their sleep cycle even they, though they force themselves to get up um, You'll see this kind of thing uh, more in young people like adolescents and such um, <clears throat> it can happen in adults like us, um, but uh, usually uh, we start out having a delayed schedule when we're young, and as we grow older, it kind of slowly shifts, and uh, the majority of people start having an advanced schedule, so they start getting sleepy at 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock in the evening, and then they want to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, so the opposite happens. Now we do these sleep diaries to kind of diagnose these things and um, What you see here is uh, the down arrow is when the person is going to bed and the up arrow is when the person's out of bed and The line is the time that they're asleep. So this is 10 30 11 o'clock and that's 6 30 uh, Right there, and then the line is when they fell asleep around 2 can you guys see that over here? Yeah. so the downtime is at about 10.30 or 11 here, and this is the morning time, so 6.30. And then these bottom two lines represent like a weekend. So the weekend comes along, they can sleep in, so they choose to go to bed later and sleep in. And lo and behold, instead of uh, you know lying in bed for three hours awake, uh, this blank spot here, uh, on the weekends, as soon as they get into bed, they fall asleep right away because they're, they're sleeping at their designated internal sleep cycle time. And then they'll sleep over until 10 o'clock, and they feel good. <laughs> okay, mood disorders. Uh, uh, you know, there's depression, anxiety, and obsessive compulsiveness, and bipolar disorder. And all these things can have a certain effect on sleep. And some of them are direct effects associated with the disorder. So depression uh, uh, sometimes will uh, produce this profound early morning awakening. In other words, a person wakes up at about 3 o'clock in the morning and can't get back to sleep. Anxiety is just mental stimulation, as we talked about before. And that uh, makes it more difficult to fall asleep when you're stimulated that way. Obsessive compulsivism is that you know, you're a controlling person. You're trying to control sleep. And the more you try to control sleep, the, the more it goes out of control. And bipolar disorder is, uh, used to be called manic depressive illness. So a person is either up high or down low depressed. And <clears throat> the sleep cycle kind of follows that type of uh, mood. So when they're in the high phase, they may not sleep very much. They may sleep two to four hours a night. When they're in the low phase, they may sleep you know, 10 or 12 hours. So you usually treat the underlying condition. And then a very common cause of uh, uh, insomnia in women is menopause. My, my wife is a, a gynecologist, a menopause specialist, so she got this card from one of her patients <laughs> that she helped and the other doctor didn't. <clears throat> so. <laughs> So it was to emphasize that one of her poor patients was uh, going around all these doctors and they're telling them, oh, don't worry about menopause, you know, don't worry about it. And, uh, you know, but it, in some people it does have a pretty significant effects and it very often affects sleep. Even if you're not having the hot flashes and such uh, that overtly awaken you, sometimes it causes a lot of sleep fragmentation and awakenings and just non-restorative sleep, a lot of stuff. So <clears throat> in, women, in a woman that's around the age of menopause, uh, very often it's one of the tipping points that causes a lot of problems, but can, it can continue on later on in life as well. Okay, sleep apnea. So 
People always ask me, how did you get interested in sleep medicine? These guys. They're, when, when I was in medical school, um, Dr. Sasson, the guy I talked about before, he brought in these three great, or four great, great big guys. And uh, he had them, you know, come up to the front of the class and stuff. And uh, it was around the time they were just describing sleep apnea and discovering what it is. I forgot this actor's name. Okay. Well, you know, they were all the, these four guys were all wearing ascots like him. And at the time, there was no such thing as a CPAP machine. And so I don't know why he has it, but they, they all took their ascots off and they had tracheostomies in. They had uh, these little plugs that they put the tra in the tracheostomy uh, during the daytime while they're awake so they could speak and eat and stuff. But uh, at night, they'd pull the plug and they'd breathe out of their tracheostomy. It worked almost 100% of the time in curing obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, but as you can see, you know, it's not a very pleasant thing to have. And so it was really nice when CPAP came around and was so uh, effective and, uh, and so uh, non-invasive. So, but um, it was pretty remarkable. And then as time went on, we figured out that not everybody has to be fat to have sleep apnea. It comes in all sizes. And there was a time they said, most people with sleep apnea are men, you know, and, and no, women didn't get it. I would say um, half of our population that we see now with sleep apnea in our center are women. Uh, again, women got ignored with this condition. So, Snoring and sleep apnea. There, there's thousands of cures for snoring. This is just one of them. But <clears throat> the trouble uh, is, is that snoring is very pervasive in society. So, you know, most people will snore at some time in their life under certain circumstances. But habitual snoring, where they're doing it uh, nearly every night, about 60% of the population and people over the age of 35 will have a tendency to snore all the time. Uh, the trouble is, is that there's only a small population of those people, only 4% of uh, women and 9% of men uh, who habitually snore will have sleep apnea bad enough to treat. And these are old numbers. That's probably gone up a lot. So the snoring of apnea is rather distinct. Uh, it's a symptom of partial airway closure. So you, the airway in your throat is beginning to collapse and the air is passing through and all the tissues in the back of the throat are vibrating and that causes snoring. And then there's a pause in the snoring because the, the airway collapses completely and obstructs. So there's no air passing through, so the fluttering stops and the person's kind of struggling to breathe at that time. And then at the end of it, the person wakes up and there's a gasp as the air starts flowing through the airway again. So what we're talking about in the airway, um, please ignore the snot in this guy's nose. I couldn't find a picture that didn't have snot in it, but that's what all this stuff is up here. So, but um, the, uh, the area that we're talking about is right here. This guy's head is cut in half, that's his tongue. And this is his soft palate, and that's his uvula. So over here, if you guys can see it, this is his tongue, and his soft palate is here at the back of the throat, and that's his uvula there. So this area right there, it's above the, the uh, epiglottis and the windpipe and the voice box down low here. That's the voice box down in here. So if you feel your, your windpipe, it's made out of cartilage, so it's like a stiff pipe. And your nose is made out of bone and cartilage, so that's like a stiff pipe. But the area between the back of your nose, so right in here, down to here, uh, right in here, down to here, uh, is made out of soft tissue. And because it's soft tissue, it's capable of collapsing. So when people have obstructive uh, sleep apnea, what's happening is that part of the airway is collapsing and narrowing when they fall asleep. So think of it about it as this. Um, if you have a, a pipe that has a rigid pipe on one end, another one there, but the one in the center, so rigid pipe, flexible pipe, rigid pipe. Um, if you're trying to make air flow through this, 
and you're sucking at one end of it, the suction you create inside the pipe is going to make the, the flexible portion collapse. So that's what this is representing. The flexible portion is collapsing. So if you turn this all on its side, and you see in my little diagram with this guy, so the rigid portion in the nose, the flexible portion in the throat, and the rigid portion down in the wind, windpipe. So that's where, where the problem lies. And so I don't know how John Kerry got in here with the limp gun, but uh, what happens is that the throat being the only non-rigid portion of the airway, uh, the snoring and apnea occurs as the uh, throat starts to collapse when we fall asleep and there's still air passing through. So the tissues vibrate and make the noise. So muscles that keep the airway open when we're awake relax when we're asleep and it allows the throat to narrow. And then uh, when that happens, uh, the muscles relax, the airway narrows, the airway closes and the snoring pauses. And then you wake yourself up to, <clears throat> to breathe and essentially the throat muscles contract and it opens the airway back up and a person will snort. And then they fall right back asleep and the muscles relax and they do it all over again. So they do that over and over. So <clears throat> the short-term complications of sleep apnea, you're waking up all the time to breathe, so your sleep is fragmented. It's not restorative. And no matter how long you sleep, you end up being sleepy in the daytime. Uh, so doing it 5 to 20 times an hour is sufficient to produce no noticeable sleepiness. There's long-term problems, though, too. It affects the circulatory system, so it can underlie hypertension, high blood pressure, heart attacks, strokes, irregular heart rhythms, and heart failure. So, um, you know, it's only been in the last few years that the cardiologists discovered sleep apnea and they started sending me patients. First, it was a little trickle, uh, and they'd have somebody with atrial fibrillation or something, they'd send them over and they'd have horrible apnea. And then they sent more people, more horrible apnea. So the more they sent, the more they found out that they're, you know, they were these people were having problems with apnea underlying their heart rhythm problems. So now we're, we're overloaded with cardiac patients. But sleep apnea comes on very slowly. You know, human learning is based on doing something like stepping on a tack. You step on it, it's an obvious stimulus. <clears throat> it's a, a significant stimulus, ouch, it hurts and you have immediate reaction, you pull your leg away. But if something happens very slowly, this is a girl who is a methamphetamine abuser, and it's interesting because these are successive uh, uh, mug shots of her. As time goes on, you can see her deterioration over time. It's happening very slowly. It's not noticeable to her, but it is to everybody else who looks at these pictures. But the same thing happens with apnea. There's a progressive acclimation to the sleepiness in life. A lot of times people deny or fail to recognize the problem. And a lot of times people view sleepiness, uh, the ability to fall asleep in the daytime as an attribute. In other words, you know, uh, I get people all the time going, I don't have a sleep problem. I can fall asleep anytime I want to. You know, I can sit down and I'll be asleep in a minute. Well, that's not right. In the daytime, you're supposed to be awake. <laughs> So, you know, uh, and it comes on very slowly, and very often that's because there is a relationship between sleep apnea and body weight. And as we gain weight slowly as we grow older, the apnea gets worse and worse and worse. This is what I look at all day long. This is a sleep study, or one page out of it. The sl average sleep study will have uh, <clears throat> eight hours worth of this. This is five minutes worth. So um, we record this stuff off of people all night long when they stay overnight. And what you see is the blue ones on top, <clears throat> they're scrunched together now because it's five minutes, but that's the, the brain waves that tell us if they're asleep or awake. And then the green lines underneath on top are eye movements. And then we have the EKG, which is this one here. And then the next green ones are leg movements. And this is a snorometer, the gray line there, the snoring. And this is airflow in and out of the nose. And the next two are um, uh, respiratory effort. And then the red line is oxygen. So what you see here in this guy is uh, there's, he's, he's having respiratory effort all the way along in these uh, tan lines. 
but um, what you see here is that there's very little airflow going on, and then the apnea stops and he snorts, and he breathes a little bit, and then he goes back to not breathing, and he snorts and breathes a little bit. So you can see these gaps in here in airflow, even though he's got effort here. And each time he has, he's not breathing, the, the oxygen level drops, and then it comes back up, and it drops, and comes back up. So he's doing this all night long. And so um, most of you, if you uh, hold your breath right now, you probably wouldn't lower your oxygen saturation very much in your blood. But when you have an apnea like this, it's different. Your airway's closed off and you're struggling to breathe and it causes the oxygen level to drop very quickly as you see here. Um, <clears throat> these are, uh, whoops. So these are 30 second periods of time. So his oxygen level is dropping down here on these big dips, like 20 or 30 points. Uh, and so it happens very suddenly, very profoundly during apnea, much different than holding your breath in the daytime. And it goes on and on and on. That's what puts the strain on uh, people. So here's the guy snoring. It also disturbs the sleep partner. <laughs> okay, so how do we treat it? You know, uh, if it is related to weight reduction, I mean weight, weight reduction is one way of doing it. This is Jenny Craig commercial, but uh, it, you know, weight reduction is very difficult, especially as we grow older. You know, if you're using sedating substances, the most common of which is there, um, avoiding it close to bedtime will help. Because anything that makes you sleep deeper when you're in, in bed, you wake up, uh, it, it's, it's harder for you to wake up when you're having an apnea, so the apneas last longer. CPAP treatment is probably the most common treatment for moderate to severe apnea. It's because it's so effective and it's non-invasive, even though when you look at this guy there, you see the stuff on his nose and the machine there and the hoses and stuff. Uh, th these uh, pictures are created by the CPAP company, so they always make it look like the guy's there smiling with his mask on, his wife's <laughs> reading and stuff, so, but, <clears throat> but basically, CPAP, it works by inflating the airway, so it's basically an air pump, and as you're trying to suck your throat closed when you inhale, it pumps up your throat like a balloon and uses air pressure to hold it open. And it's effective more than 90% of the time. When we get people in the laboratory and we're working on them, we can get it to work. The trouble is, is that <clears throat> it's keeping it working at home because it takes a lot of dedication and, and it's a contraption at best. So what that means is there's a lot of little things that can go wrong with it. And a lot of times people give up before they can kind of figure all those things out and get it to work. There's no major complications associated with it and it completely reverses the short and long-term complications. What that means is that uh, once you get beyond that level where the CPAP itself is disturbing your sleep, you know, you're sleeping with it regularly, it gets rid of all those little arousals associated with sleep apnea and it makes you sleep deeper and better so you waken more refreshed and you're more awake in the daytime. But also the long-term complications are the big one. There's been a lot of studies that look at eight to 10 uh, years of people with sleep apnea. And you know, people who are not using a, a CPAP are getting treated in some way, and people who are. And uh, there's a substantial reduction in high blood pressure, heart attacks, strokes, and all kinds of stuff. And so it, um, it's a, I tell people it's kind of like finding out you have elevated cholesterol and you have to take a statin and the statin makes you feel kind of yucky, you know, you get stiffness over and stuff. But you're lowering your cholesterol now in the hopes that 10 years from now you don't have hardening of the arteries and get a heart attack. Because if you get that heart attack, it's harder to reverse a heart attack than it is to prevent it. So same thing with sleep apnea. If you get diagnosed early in life and you use the treatment regularly, uh, you know, you're trying to prevent something later on in life. So it's a big thing. So again, 
what it does is it inflates your throat just like a balloon. Uh, that's, so we're going the opposite direction here where, you know, it's collapsed so the CPAP is inflating it and keeping that airway open. And, whoops, and then, so air pressure is the force that's generated. So when you blow up a balloon, the air going into it is moving, that's air flow. Once inside the balloon, it generates a pressure so the balloon expands. You can tie the balloon off and the balloon will stay inflated even though there's no more airflow. But uh, if you punch a hole in it and the air starts flowing out, to keep the balloon inflated, you now have to put more air in. So a CPAP machine does both of those things. It modulates airflow and air pressure to keep the airway open. So as this diagram shows, <laughs> this guy's got a CPAP mask on and, and what it's doing is pumping up this area. So the CPAP mask and the area there that it's pumping up to keep it open. But the air movement comes in as if the mask is uh, leaking or if uh, when you breathe in and out, you're moving air in and out. And so the machine has to make adjustments in airflow with that. Uh, modern CPAP machines kind of look like this. Uh, there's a humidifier with water tank on the side and that's the CPAP itself. Water tank, CPAP. And um, <clears throat> they also keep track of things. So these new ones, they can uh, adjust themselves and they tell us what's going on with leakage and pressure and whether the person's having events. So these are one hour periods of time going across this way and the machine's turning the pressure up and down on this line and it's counting up uh, apnea that might be coming through on this line here. So on this person, uh, he's, uh, his pressure's maxing out and he's having apnea. So it ain't working perfectly for him. Um, and it gives us reports like this so we can follow patients and figure things out. So here's another smiling person with their CPAP mask on. <laughs> this is a nasal pillow mask where the prongs go into the nostrils. They now have nasal cushion masks where they don't have the little pillows that go in the nostrils and it, the cushion just sets underneath the, the nose with this type of a headgear. So they're even less obtrusive than this. Uh, and then the, the chamber style masks have gotten much smaller nowadays. They used to cover most of the face, so now they just go over the tip of the nose and that's made out of rubber and it's held in place and seals. And then full face masks, they cover their nose and mouth if people have trouble keeping their mouth shut adequately when they're on treatment. So again, they're here reading their book with their CPAP mask on <laughs> and smiling. But it does work. <clears throat> This is a readout from a patient who has bad sleep apnea. And up on the top line, the, these are one hour periods of time. And this is their oxygen level. So each time they have an apnea, there'll be a dip and a recovery. So you get a sawtooth pattern. So, so one hour period, or this one hour or half hour? Uh, I think it's, what is it? well, any case. But it's going across this way. And the sawtooth pattern, each one of those is an apnea. So right here, they put the CPAP on them, right there. <clears throat> and then they start turning the pressure up. So these are pressure changes on the bottom here. And as they turn the pressure up, you see how much different this looks up here compared down there. So, you know, the apnea gets worse during dream sleep, so he's having a couple of little ones there. But by the end of the night, they got it cleared up pretty good. The other thing to see is that <clears throat> the sawtooth pattern in oxygen is mirrored by the uh, pulse. This is the heart rate, and see how it gets that same sawtooth passion, uh, pattern down here? That's because with every time you stop breathing, your heart slows down and then it speeds up as soon as you start breathing again. Oral appliances are another way of treating apnea. They work about 50% of the time. They consist of these little gizmos that um, are on, you fit into your mouth and it looks like that. And basically what it's doing is pulling your lower jaw forward. Uh, it's trying to pull the tongue away from the back of the throat to open the airway up. So it, it works for snoring and mild sleep apnea and sometimes it'll work for bad apnea. Like I said, effectiveness is about 50%. But if somebody ever gets the, you know, if they have significant apnea and they get an oral appliance, 
you should be tested afterwards to ensure that it works. So these are the complications associated with it. You know, that's uh, jaw, jaw joint pain, uh, teeth movement. Uh, sometimes the apnea actually gets worse and few long-term treatment trials. In other words, there's a lot of uh, treatment trials that look at these things, uh, but it's hard to say how good they work. But <clears throat> I kind of, uh, uh, for people who are interested in those, you know, we give them a tryout because I've been surprised. You know, people who look like they're perfect, doesn't work. People who look like they never work, it works. So, you know, it's a little bit of trial and error with it. There are certain surgeries that can be done for sleep apnea. Uh, they focus on opening up the airway. So if you got a clogged up nose, maybe open that up. Removing tissue at the back of the throat uh, and other throat surgeries and moving your whole face around. And I got tracheostomy on the bottom there. Not too many people get tra tracheostomy anymore. But they do surgeries where this one shows that the surgeon is cutting away the part of the soft palate and the uvula, the little dangly thing, and that keeps some of that tissue from getting sucked into the airway. It, it works better on snoring than it does for sleep apnea treatment. And this is uh, radio ablation where they stick a needle in and it melts some of the tissue and the soft palate, again, shrinking it up. And again, it works better for snoring than it does otherwise. And this is one of those facial surgeries where they cut the jaw and they move the jaw out of a little ways uh, and they plate it back in, both the top and the bottom. And that's to give you a bigger throat. And that's it. Okay.